through books of the Bible. So we've been going through the Gospel of Luke for over a year. We're starting a series on the Book of Acts. Uh, next week, actually, we'll be launching that. I'm always excited with these new series. But in the Staten Island campus, because we have so many people that come that are new, uh, that are not in the Brooklyn campus, it's kind of like out of context. So we will do uh, either topical messages here until we go every week, uh, or uh, expound on certain passages. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at Psalm 19. I just felt the Lord lay that, lay that on my heart. So I want to talk about today is the gospel as seen in creation. The gospel as seen in creation. And all of you lovers of beauty and aesthetics and nature will love the things that I think the word of God will expound today uh, through me today. So let's go to Psalm 19. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky proclaims his handiwork. Day after day it pours out speech, and night after night it reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice it is not heard in. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. In them he has sent, set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man who runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of the of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The Lord of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare the innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of the great transgression. And finally, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And so, as I said, we're going to be speaking about the gospel in creation. The gospel in creation. And our text is Psalm 19. And we understand that God is the creator, of course, of all things. And that means that God is involved in not just the individual affairs of our life, but he's the one who holds up natural law. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1 that in Christ all things, not just spiritual things, all things hold together. And furthermore, the scripture seems to indicate that the temple that was made by the Jews, first by Moses, is actually patterned after the cosmos, after the universe. Um, which indicates that the universe is God's temple or God's sanctuary. And you can make a case of that in Genesis 1, which we're not going to do today. But be that as it may, um, it tells us in the book uh, of, uh, what is it, Exodus chapter 25, God said to Moses, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And then it says, according to all I will show you after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even though even then shall you make it. So the tabernacle on earth was patterned after something. It tells us in the book of Hebrews that this pattern was actually made after the heavens in Hebrews chapter 8. Um, and so in Isaiah chapter 66, I love this. It says, thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne. So heaven is where he sits. That's where his manifest presence is. That's the epicenter of God. Heaven is my throne. And listen to this. And the earth is my footstool. Wow. You get a picture of God sitting down in heaven. 
and his feet reach all the way to the earth. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. And then it tells us in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah is speaking here and he says in verse 1, In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. The train of his robe. The train means the, the length of his robe. It was like a train. Uh, it just flowed and flowed and flowed. And so uh, basically what he's saying there is that he seated, he seated on his throne in heaven. And then it says the train of his robe filled the temple, which now connects God's throne to God's temple. If you put that with Isaiah 66, same writer. He said, the earth, I'm sorry, he said, the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. That shows the universe is his temple. Are you seeing that connection? The earth is my footstool. He said, the train of his robe filled the, what, the temple, mm -hmm. sitting on the throne. It's incredible that what that tells us is that the whole universe is God's sanctuary. Isn't that amazing? Now, it actually tells us also in Isaiah that there is no sanctuary or temple that can house him. So God is bigger than any building. He's also bigger than the universe. The universe is in, uh, to use the, the, the famous movie, The Matrix, the universe is actually in the matrix of God. It's in God. Uh, and so God is not in time and space. Time and space is in God. It's just mind-blowing. That's why a scientist can't figure God out. If they could, they'd be as smart as God. It's beyond uh, human capacity. It's beyond human wisdom. And so we see that the throne is associated and is located uh, in his temple. And then it says, Isaiah's uh, vision said in chapter 6, he says, Above him, meaning God, stood the seraphim. These are some kind of angelic beings. Each had six wings, and with two they covered their face, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Someone say the whole earth. The whole earth. The whole earth is full of his glory. No matter where you go, you can't get away from the glory of God. That's a profound statement because that means that everything that we see, everywhere we go, should respond to God's word because it's full of his glory. In other words, it's under his canopy. It's under his name. It's under his nature. Everything. Uh, uh, it's not just in church on Sunday. Everywhere you go in the world, the earth is filled with his glory. Uh, that means Jesus reigns everywhere. Even if people don't believe in him, they don't realize it, that he is their king. He is the king of kings. So it also shows us that we could see and should see the beauty of God everywhere. Everywhere we go. Um, it, it shows us something about who God is, especially nature. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And then it says, um, for what can be known about God is plain to everybody, plain to them, because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so that men are without excuse. And so everything reveals God's nature and glory. It, it shows you uh, his invisible attributes are depicted in the beauty of the universe. Powerful, powerful stuff to the point in which men are without excuse. So in a sense, nature is proclaiming the gospel. It's not proclaiming the specifics of the death, burial, and resurrection, but it's giving us enough of a, a sense of, of the fact that there is a creator who gave us an audit universe, who designed everything, 
that men are now responsible to seek God out. So on the day of judgment, there'll never be an excuse for anybody even if they never heard the gospel. That's what Paul is saying. Isn't that powerful? So that as a back backdrop, we go to the psalmist, Psalm 19. And so there are 66 books in the Bible. There are 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. So 66 books in the Bible. Many, many people have said that nature is the 67th book of the Bible. And that's because of passages like this that we're about to read. So there's really no conflict be between science and religion. That's all man-made. There's no conflict between religion and using your, your mind. And that also means that you can't separate religion from the earth world. Can't separate it from nature, from politics, from science, from art, music, education. It's all showing and revealing God's glory. So let's go to Psalm 19. Uh, we already read it, but we're going to unpack it verse by verse. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Look at those words, declare and proclaim. And it says, day after day they pour out speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes throughout all the earth, their words to the end of the world. So it uses terms like de declare, proclaim, speech, knowledge, and it says that there's nowhere where their voice or their speech is not heard, meaning uh, those are the same words used to preach the gospel. It's saying that they're proclaiming and they're declaring the glory of God. That's the role of nature. That's the role of the sun and the moon and the stars and the way God set up the planetary systems, the laws of lift, the laws of nature, the laws of gravity. Uh, laws of physics, subatomic physics, all of this is showing that there is an ordered universe. Uh, it's showing that, uh, and this is what happened in uh, the 16th century, a guy named Isaac Newton, when he discovered uh, the laws of nature, it indicated the fact that we can search for laws because God as a creator designed it. So because he believed in God, he had a sneaking suspicion there must be laws because God is orderly. Because God designed things, there has to be some kind of laws. And he's the one who discovered it. That's why he was called the greatest scientist of all time, even outdoing uh, Albert Einstein. And so Isaac Newton, as a result, wrote more books on the Bible, on theology, than he did on science. But you won't learn that in school because they try to secularize and sanitize in their mind uh, history. And so we see here that the heavens are preaching and proclaiming and giving knowledge. Uh, it's amazing. And this is good news because that means we have a purpose. So if God made an ordered universe, if God made the world, that means he must have put you in this world with a way of fulfilling its purpose, of fulfilling something. In other words, Everybody here has a calling. Everybody here has been designed by God. Can you imagine? God would go through uh, all of this work to design everything, even beyond atoms. I mean, we think we used to think atoms was the smallest um, substance in, in the known world, and then they found subatomic particles. Well, it goes deeper and deeper. There's so much in an atom probably is another universe if you excavate it. And so the smallness of God is just as fantastic as the bigness of God. So God's going to be so meticulous in creating these little things called atoms that become those uh, the basis of molecules that keep everything together. Can you imagine him then putting all of you on the earth without a purpose and a design? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? No. And so all of you have a purpose. That's why this is good news. I know it took 10 minutes, a little bit of labor for me to say that. So you gotta follow it, you gotta follow it. Sometimes you gotta use your brain in church. It's not just your heart and your spirit. You gotta think. So God 
gave us a purpose because it would not make any sense. It would be so inconsistent of him to go through all of this trouble to place us in such an ordered world that's in the midst of an ordered galaxy, an ordered universe, and not have a design for us. Um, and, um, and so this also shows us that there is absolutely no rational reason to believe there is no God. I mean, even if you never saw a physical miracle in the name of Jesus, I've seen many, but even if you've never had an answered prayer, I've had many, just looking at the universe, it would be like, to say that there is no God, it would be like walking somewhere in a desert island and finding a watch and saying, oh, the marvels of evolution over billions of years that created a watch. Now, whether you believe in evolution or not, there is people who believe that God used evolution and they're still Christians, but there are most people who don't believe that God had anything to do with evolution, that there is no God. Uh, those who espouse that, a lot of them don't believe in that or they're agnostic. But the point is, we are more complicated than any watch. The human brain is more complex than any computer we've ever devised. And if you just study the human anatomy and all the circulatory system and the way the brain functions and muscles respond to the nerves and the way uh, the blood flows and water and all this, I mean, it's just so mind-blowing. You can give your whole life just to studying the nervous system and still not plumb the depths of the nervous system of the human body. Can you imagine? We think we're so smart, and we're the ones who created these computers, we can't even figure out the human body. There's still doctors who can't figure out the ailments that we have. That's why you need to have second and third and fourth opinions if you're going to have surgery. Um, and so, to say that there is no God when you see this universe, it would be even more absurd to say that this watch came by chance, by random chance. There was a, a famous uh, philosopher who said this, his name is Damon Linker. He said, if atheism, that is to say there is no God, if atheism is true, it is far from being good news. Amen to that. Amen. Learning that we're alone in the universe, that no one hears or answers our prayers, that humanity is entirely the product of random, by chance meaning, random events, that we have no more intrinsic dignity than a non-human and non-animal, than clumps of matter, that we face certain annihilation and death, in other words, there's no life after death, that our sufferings are pointless. Can you imagine all the suffering you've been through actually was pointless if there's no God? That our lives and what we love do not matter in a larger sense, and that those who commit horrific evils and elude human punishment get away with their crimes, mm -hmm. sort of. All of this and much more is utterly tragic. That's a famous philosopher named Damon Lincoln. Friedrich Nietzsche, a German philologist and philosopher, he was possibly the most influential philosopher of the last 200 years, he was famous for saying, God is dead. And actually, the New York Times mimicked that in the 1967, I think, edition. They actually announced God is dead because they thought there was so much evidence for uh, random chance naturalistic evolution that they said that. Um, and then, of course, they had later editions that rebutted that. That's another story. So he said, God is dead. Listen to this. Nietzsche said, the Christian God is pitiable. Pitiful, meaning he, he deserves pity. He's absurd. He's a crime against life. He has encouraged people to fear their bodies, their passions, and their sexuality. And he has promoting a, he has promoted a pulling morality and compassion, which has made us weak. So he thinks compassion makes us weak. There is no ultimate meaning or value. Human beings have no business offering an indulgent alternative 
in God. That's what he said. He said a lot more. He actually said that it's, it's a slander to say that God is love. He said slanderous to love since God wants also to judge and love should never ever see sins in need of forgiveness. So the right there is belittling the cross. Um, but what happened to Friedrich Nietzsche? You can Google it. This is actually what happened and this is the result of atheism and many, many atheists have all had terrible ends, um, unfortunately, especially the philosophers. But this is what happened to Nietzsche. He's following a psychotic breakdown in 1889 at the age of 44. He was admitted to the Basel Mental Asylum. And on the 18th of January, 1889, he was transferred to the Jenna Mental In uh, Asylum and he remained in demented darkness until his death, the age of 44, on August 25th, 1900. That's the end. You don't know or believe there's any God. If you follow that out, this is what he did. He followed it out to his logical conclusion. There's no reason to live. It drove him mad. There's no reason to love. No reason to honor someone at a funeral. No reason to do good to someone. You can't even call good evil or evil good. There is no good or evil. There's no morality because morality comes from God. So everything that you base your life upon collapses under atheism. Everything you've done and built, your families, your loves, and all the time you spent in school to prepare for a career, living a purposeful life, that's a house of straw that's been burned up by your atheist ideology. But the good news is the heavens declare what? The glory of God. It's ridiculous and absurd. And actually, the psalmist in Psalm 14 said, the fool has said there is no God. There have been atheists for thousands of years. This is nothing new under the sun. And God says, they're fools if they say there is no God. Now, if I'm dealing with an atheist, I'm not going to call him a fool. I'm going to love him. I'm not going to objectify him or categorize him. I'm going to just get to know him and humanize him. And there's a reason for all that. I don't believe there really is such thing as an atheist. Deep down in their heart, they all know there's God. There's very few atheists in a foxhole. Very few atheists who are at their deathbed. That's right. Very few, if any. But Nietzsche's atheism drove him insane. And that's the logical conclusion for atheism, if you really want to look at it. And so... The psalmist, Psalm 19, goes on to say, in these heavens he has set a tent for the sun. Now the Bible is poetic. It's not always literary, in, in, literal in its literary format. So sometimes it uses metaphors, parables, and uh, it uses symbols. And so then now this is what he's doing. He's getting very poetic. And he's, he's saying that God has set a tent for the sun which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber. And like a strong man, he runs its course with joy. Meaning that son is just gonna obey God all the time. You can count on it. Huh. It's rising is from the end of the heavens and it's circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. It reminds me when it says it's circuit is to the end of them. And in the 1800s there were the Methodist circuit riders preaching the gospel. Well, nature is like a circuit rider going forth every day. Nowhere you go in the world are you outside the guise of this gospel of creation. This good news that you are not random. You're not born by accident. You're not born by chance. You have a design. You have a purpose. God called you before you were even born, the Bible says. Amen. He said that about Jeremiah, before your mother even knew you, I knew you, and I called you to be a prophet. He could say that about all of you. Psalm 139, he says, you are beautifully and wonderfully made. He said, all the days of my life are written in your book. God has a book with your name on it. It's not just your fingerprints. It's not just your personality. He hardwired you to cer a certain way. There's certain friends that you have. They light up the room everywhere they go. They're high-eye personalities. That's an influencer. 
uh, man, and, and the introverts and the high seas think, oh, I wish I could be like that. I can't make <laughs> friends so bad. Well, you know what? God made you like that. Yes. He hardwired yes. you. So yes. There's certain gifts you have that other people don't have. Right. We need you because there's something about you that I don't have. And nobody else in this room, nobody else in this world has, nobody else who ever lived has your fingerprints. Every snowflake is unique. You are more unique than a snowflake. Isn't that amazing? And so, somebody in this room needs you. Needs your gifts. Needs your calling. Needs your vocation. Needs your brain. Needs your wisdom. Needs the way you think. Needs your personality. All of us fit together perfectly. That's why the Bible says we together are the body of Christ. Isn't that a wonderful thing? We are the visible manifestation of the invisible Christ. Christ is the head, we are the neck down. Mm -hmm. All of you are so important. Mm -hmm. And so, the psalmist goes on to say, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. So he goes from using nature to generally present the glory of God. So he's doing this in a, in a very general way. Uh, uh, sense he's given the concept that, that God does exist but now he's saying to the person who's thinking alright the heavens declare his glory but what do I do now now he's going to tell you what to do he's saying this same God who meticulously created you in the universe has also given you a book to follow to know how to live in light of his creation isn't that an amazing thing the Bible Outside of Christ himself, the Bible is the greatest gift that God has ever given to us. Besides life and, and the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, he's given us a Bible. And so the author goes from, actually it's David, he goes from declaring the beauty of God through nature, now he's declaring the beauty and the need for the law of God. And so he tells us, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. I love that. He revives the soul. What does the word revive mean? It means it motivates us. Mm -hmm. Gives us a sense of purpose and meaning in life. Mm -hmm. um, the word of God explains why we're alive. I remember, and, and I can't do it for too long, but I remember the darkness of my soul before I came to Christ in January 10th, 1978. And I remember now knowing where I'd go when I die. Being so frustrated in the music world because we'd go from one big gig to another and have so many friends, but I just, I'd look at the stars in the sky and I said, it's gotta be more than this. I said, I'm making music, people love it, but the next day it's gone. What is the purpose? What is the point of all this? And I was just filled with such emptiness that I came crashing down when I was 19. I wasn't a drug addict, I wasn't bad person uh, in, in terms of you know wasn't hurting anybody I was just trying to make it music but it all crashed down because it could not sustain the depth of the hole in my soul and I was exposed to the gospel when I was 16 and I used to go to church once in a while you know my long hair my black leather jacket walking in like this you know and I would never sing a song they gave me a hymnal in those days we had hymnals no. And I would just, man, I wouldn't express myself. I was just inside. I was just internalizing. Is this really true? Are these people cuckoo or what? <laughs> what are black and white, rich and poor? All these people, young and people with long hair, hippies in those days. And um, you guys think you got it going with the holes in your jeans? We had acid wash jeans in those days. <laughs> we, there's nothing. You guys just copy what's already been. Uh -huh. We walked around so with psychedelic clothes, man. So we had so not true. only bell bottoms, we had elephant bells. Uh -huh. I mean, my bell bottoms, I, I walked around with drapes. <laughs> you know, it was almost like Batman. If I would have put them on my shoulders, I could have went off on a clip. But it was like, man, we had it going. Yeah. And yeah. I saw the whole church filled with young people like that. I said, wow, man, this is. And by the time I was 19, I couldn't take it anymore. I went away with my, my mother to see if Christians really meant it during the week. So I went to a convention and God just blasted me. And I, I'm not going to get into the story, but I did 
find that God was real in that convention. I met real Christians that had a real walk with God outside of the church service. And thank God he sent a young man by the name of Michael Pierre to lead me to Christ, a young man my age. I don't know where he is, but I'll always be grateful to him. And so the word of God revives the soul. It gives you a sense of meaning and purpose. It's amazing. I love jazz. I used to hang out with the greatest jazz players of the era, perhaps who ever lived. I used to hang out with guys like Joe Pass when they came into town and Joe Palmer and others and listen to Dizzy Gillespie. Man, I was hanging out with these, but yet there was something in my heart. No matter how great they played, there was something missing. Something missing that I found only Christ could fill that gap. And then the writer not only says, the Lord, the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. He says, the testimony of the Lord is sure. Someone say it's sure. Sure. Making wise the simple. There's not too many things that are sure today. There's a lot of broken hearted people. You're getting unfriended every week. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> I get unfriended five times a week and I'm trying to figure out what in the world I'm doing wrong, but that's another conversation. Probably because I don't like everybody's page. I got too many pages, I guess. But the point is, instead of the up and down values of the culture, one day this guy's a hero, next day everyone's jumping on the bandwagon against him or her. Uh, it's the it's called the vicissitudes of life. It's mercurial. It's like mercury in the thermostat. It goes up and down. It's reflecting the atmosphere. God's word is a thermostat. It actually uh, controls the atmosphere. The word of the Lord is, is sure. His word is settled in heaven. Yes. It will never, ever be proven untrue, That's right. never be taken away. Yes. The word of God I found is just life to my soul. Yes. Bread yes. for me. The living bread. Jesus said, I'm the living bread. It came down from heaven. He who eats of this bread will never hunger. Told the woman at the well, if you drink of the water of the world, you'll be thirsty again. But if you drink of the water I give you, yes. you'll never, yes. ever thirst. Yes. The word of God is sure. It's not up and down based on culture, based on the changing values of a nation. The word of the Lord is sure. Then it says, making wise the simple. Yes. The simple is a word that 